Um, I'm a professor of geography at the Maxwell School of Public Policy and Citizenship um, at Syracuse University. And uh, I'm also affiliated with a number of other programs and departments because my work is very, very interdisciplinary. Um, I've worked uh, for many years in Bangladesh. I worked there for the United Nations for a while, uh, but I've also worked there in a capacity of, as a researcher. And as a person who originally trained as a geologist and then became a geographer and then worked in the development industry, I bring very multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral perspective to my work. I've uh, lived and worked on three continents, so I try to bring those kind of experiential and personal learnings to my research and work. And it's really important for me to do work that's uh, both theoretically grounded, but also um, empirically rich and, and applicable and useful to people. So South Asia um, is a place of great rivers, not as big as the Amazon, but the next two large rivers are in South Asia, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. And they originate in the Himalayan mountains. And they come through China, Tibet, Nepal, India, and they both meet in Bangladesh to drain into the Indian Ocean through the Bay of Bengal. So my work is situated in a place of great river presence, um, but the rivers also drive not only the fertile soil and the growth of civilization in South Asia, but also very much the current geopolitics because so many different countries are dependent on these mighty rivers. And these rivers bring both blessing in terms of agriculture, agri agrarian societies, water for all the different needs, whether it's industry, agriculture, municipalities, but they also bring a lot of suffering with annual monsoonal flooding. So this is a monsoon prone area with a seasonal heavy rainfall in the summer months. And when both the rivers that, you know, that are coming through the Himalayas and meeting together, and both of them peak at the same time, they, they flood large parts of Bangladesh. So that causes this other set of coping mechanisms where people have learned to live in the dry season without water and then in the wet season with a lot of water. So living with both floods and droughts. And then because it's in the tropics, um, tropical cyclones are what are known as hurricanes. And they push seawater onto the land through storm surges. So water plays a huge role in how people live, how they make their livelihoods, their progress, their visions of development, <clears throat> their, their societal growth. So most people in Bangladesh have a very um, special relationship to water because we're so dependent on it. So there's always too much water or too little water, wrong timing of water, wrong kind of water, but there's a great respect for water. Uh, people are very resilient, people are very hardy because you, if you do not respect the water, you can't survive in a place, which is just a, you know, a riverine, it's floodplains basically. So one thing that I've noticed in terms of commonalities of water politics in South Asia and other places like Latin America is how the very poor are always marginalized in water access and in water decision making. But in the case of Bangladesh, because of the huge number of rivers, just thousands and thousands of them, that places can become very isolated very quickly. But at the same time, there's very centralized decision-making. There's very centralized government structures in place. And as a result, all the politics becomes very vertical. So you're always dependent on the national government to make decisions. There isn't a lot of decentralization. So people are often left to deal with crises themselves, except for in times of great disasters, like the storm surge comes through, or a, cy a cyclone, or a, or a tornado. Then you see relief activities and disaster management. But in many other ways, people are often left to fend for themselves. Um, <clears throat> however, having said that, the Bangladesh government is quite active in trying to manage its water resources because it's so heavily dependent on it. Because we share uh, around 53 or 54 rivers with India, so transboundary water plays a role in our geopolitics with regional neighboring countries. Um, how water is controlled or denied between nation states, you know, sours or facilitates different kinds of other uh, geopolitical or international relations. Within Bangladesh, one of the big things that is a big concern right now is India is planning to link upstream different rivers in the whole river basins. So that means there'll be further withdrawal of rivers, water before it reaches Bangladesh. So that will then create a crisis for the agrarian economy. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, and in light of this, we're also facing challenges of climate change. Because of climate change already changing precipitation patterns, rainfall, flooding peak times, river flow, um, as well as sea level rise and salinity intrusion uh, um, from the ocean into the bay and upstream, we're seeing a lot of different kinds of water-related problems. So you've got on one hand river sharing issues, you have groundwater exploitation, you have uncertainty and variability in rainfall patterns and in tropical storms. So what we're seeing is different parts of the country are facing different kinds of water stress. So some places are facing drought, while others are facing more um, frequent or uncertain flooding, whereas the entire coastal belt is having saltwater intrusion into both groundwater and surface water sources. So what we are seeing is that in many places where it, you're surrounded by water, but it's not potable, it's not drinkable. So I call this living in a place, you know, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink, because the groundwater is saline, the surface water is saline or contaminated. So as a result, uh, households are facing severe drinking water crisis within the, within the home. Agricultural crops are failing because of salinity or storms or unseasonal flooding. So we're trying to adapt to climate change in different ways. So one thing Bangladesh has been kind of at the forefront is in climate adaptation out of necessity. Um, so resilient people who are now facing more challenges are learning how to adapt to all the vagaries of climate change and you have a lot of different countries that are coming to Bangladesh to learn because climate change is going to end up affecting everyone and climate change is basically water change. It's a change in the hydrological cycle and in the hydrosocial cycle in that water society relationship. So one thing that I've been studying recently um, is how water is affecting people's livelihoods and their ability to flourish um, both in terms of realizing their human right to water, but also dealing with uncertainties in climatic patterns and weather-related and water-related uh, events. So one of my uh, projects has been looking at issues around household uh, domestic water security. And this is where gender becomes really important because it is usually women and girls who are fetching water from very far away for their domestic use, whether it's for bathing, drinking, cooking, cleaning, sanitation, uh, for poultry or livestock management, or even sometimes small-scale household economic activities. So in areas with severe drinking water crisis, whether it's due to quantity failure, there's an insufficient amount, or a quality issue in terms of not adequate or clean, safe, uh, uncontaminated water, women and girls are spending hours a day fetching water. Um, and that has severe uh, gender implications in the house and who gets access to education, to employment opportunities, to even leisure time and rest and, and to be healthy because water is very heavy. So fetch it, carrying water over distances has health impacts on women and girls. Uh, girls are dropping out of school to help their mothers fetch water. Uh, we're seeing that women are really struggling to maintain the home but also spending a lot of time. But when a community water well or a local water source is managed well in an inclusive way, in a gender sensitive way, it reduces women's burdens. So that link between how water is governed and gender equity or reduction in gender suffering is, is an important part. Um, linked to that, I've been also looking at the gender politics of climate adaptation. So what do we mean by adapting to climate change? Is it more resilient infrastructure? Is it different kinds of cropping mechanisms? Is it things like floating gardens because the landscape is flooded? Is it more salt resistant or salt tolerant crops? You know, how does that change nutrition patterns? How does it change market relations or household income strategies? Uh, who is making decisions um, in which, which kind of adaptation technology is, is being used or what is happening? So some of the issues that uh, regarding water in Bangladesh are common in other parts of the world. Uh, it's just very extreme in Bangladesh because of its geographical location uh, with these two mighty rivers in the subtropics in a cyclone, in a tropical cyclone prone area. Uh, the whole country is only three meters above sea level, so it's a very flat country. Um, and there's a lot of people in this space. The poverty level is fairly high, although it's been growing fairly rapidly recently. So water stress will get worse in the future, in the coming years, as different needs of water, you know, there are different competitions 
between water, so how we govern and manage water is important in Bangladesh um, as in other countries of the world, especially because for a developing country, water is so critical to progress, social progress, economic growth, um, and just basic human well-being. So one of the issues that I've been uh, writing about for a long time, in addition to issues around gender and water, and role of water in development and in health and vulnerability and floods and around climate change, is the human right to water. And the book that I wrote a few years ago, I co-edited, co uh, was called The Right to Water, and the subtitle is Politics, Governance, and Social Struggles. It has been translated from English into Spanish and Polish, and the Spanish version is widely available. Uh, it was uh, translated in Mexico, but it is widely available in uh, Latin America. And basically, the book looks at issues around water justice, the challenges to materializing the human right to water, what it means, uh, we have different case studies, but also the ways you can overcome it and how the right to water gives you a set of vocabulary and tools for the poor to margin marginalize groups to come together um, to, for a common goal of water justice and in making water democracy work. So uh, at that book, uh, hopefully, uh, will be available to everyone in Latin America more widely. It came out in 2014. And uh, a second book that I've helped co-edit is called uh, Eating, Drinking, and Surviving. And again, that's looking at global issues around access to water, uh, food, and nutrition. So my hope is that um, when we think about water, we think of water in a very kind of uh, as a many splendored thing in very multidisciplinary way, but also recognize the way water connects us all, but all water impacts everything we do, everything that's a social, political, economic, cultural, spiritual, ecological, that we need water for preservation of the ecology, but then we also need water for human survival and, and human growth and progress. So my hope is that we can achieve true water justice in impoverished places like Bangladesh, but also in, in all other countries um, in Latin America, where water is such a key, a central issue to livelihood and survival on a daily basis.